welcome everyone for another session of the AMU Journal Club. And I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for the day, Ben Kampa. And Ben is a PhD student in Andrew Beam's lab at Harvard School of Public Health, whose research focuses on uncertainty estimation for med uh, medical machine learning. So definitely a very relevant topic for a lot of us. But in addition to this, uh, Ben also works on NLP for medical data, uh, question and answering tasks too. Before his PhD, he interned at Microsoft Research and earned his MPhil in computational biology at the University of Cambridge as a Churchill scholar. And before that, he studied math and computer science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I know usually we have a few uh, Duke alums uh, on this chat, so hopefully the Q&A doesn't get too feisty given that it's March. But in any case, uh, welcome Ben, and we're really excited to hear your presentation about uncertainty estimation. So please take it away. Thank you so much. I'll share my screen and get started. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that great introduction. Oh, sorry, my computer freaked out a little bit there. You will present. Okay. Here we go. Thank you for that great introduction and thank you for the invitation to present today. Um, I'm Ben Kampa. I'm a third year PhD student in the BIG program at Harvard Medical School in the lab of Andrew Beam and the Harvard School of Public Health. And today I'll be presenting on a viewpoint that I recently published in Nature Digital Medicine called Second Opinion Needed, uh, Communicating Uncertainty in Medical Machine Learning. If you'd like to follow along with these slides, you can access them at this tiny URL, which is tinyurl.com backslash uh, AIMI in all capital letters, uh, 0311. So to ground our conversation, I'm going to begin with a clinical vignette. And this is set in perhaps uh, 2050 or whenever you know machine learning becomes more ubiquitous in the clinic. And we have a 29 year old woman who presents to the ED with uh, difficulty breathing and chest pain. This has occurred for a while, but recently got worse. And she doesn't have any other main symptoms besides uh, pain in her right ribs after taking a deep breath and coughing up some green phlegm. Uh, she's vomited once and she has a slightly elevated temperature, uh, a high heart rate and um, a respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute pulse ox of only 92 and crackles in the right mid lung field and a clear x-ray. So uh, as a expert ED clinician, you may be thinking pneumonia, but since it's 2050, you of course have a machine learning model uh, right by your side that helps you out with diagnoses. And so if you consult this model, it could suggest something like this. So it has a point estimate of the probability of pneumonia, which is only 60%, with a high level of uncertainty, anywhere from 40% to 80% of this patient actually having uh, pneumonia. And given your clinical knowledge and experience, this seems like um, a high level of uncertainty for this model that you, you, know, you trust and use on a daily basis. So this causes you to perhaps take a closer look at that clear chest X-ray. And what you see looks pretty normal. Until you realize, sorry? It's flipped. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the heart is uh, flipped from its typical orientation. So everything's backwards. This patient actually has situs invernus, which is a rare medical condition uh, that caused your machine learning model to predict a high level of uncertainty because uh, one would imagine in the training data set, there aren't many examples of patients with situs invernus. And so this is one way that uncertainty estimation could be incorporated in medical machine learning models of the future. Another way is preventing some insidious and silent failure modes of medical machine learning. So in this recent work from Nestor et al. in 2019, uh, the authors trained four different types of machine learning models on the MIMIC-3 data set. And they uh, constructed the training set in three different ways. In the first way, they presented the models only the data from 2001 to 2002. In the second way, they gave the models data from the previous year. And then in the final way, they gave the models the full history of the, of the data up until uh, the test year that they'd like to assess the model in. And in 2008, the EMR changed. 
So we see that this dramatic example of data set shift caused a drop in performance in predicting mortality, specifically the, the y-axis represents the AUC of predicting mortality. Uh, and, and for the models that were trained on sort of the oldest data from 2001 to 2002, there's a huge drop off. They essentially become coin flips in predicting mortality because, you know, every, there's, uh, everything's different between the, the two EMRs and, and the models weren't trained on any of that data. The models with uh, more um, recent data and perhaps the data from the new EMR are able to recover their performance. Another thing of note is that in, in the top row, there is a steady decline of model AUC over time. And this represents sort of kind of a standard data set shift. As models, as time goes on, the test distribution will naturally shift away from the training distribution. And uncertainty estimation is one way to possibly detect data set shift. And so in the Beam Lab, we're thinking about how we can incorporate medical machine learning models towards the goal of medical artificial intelligence. We don't view medical AI as a method, but rather a goal, something we're aspiring to. And one way uh, that I envision machine learning, uh, you know, propelling us towards that goal is quantitative tracking of disease progression. So this is a time course of multiple MRI scans of a patient with glioblastoma and red is segmentation of the edema of a glioblastoma tumor. And over time, you see the patient's tumor shrinking in response to the treatment that they received. And eventually, in the bottom um, second and third uh, pictures from the left, the, the edema completely disappears. In fact, I think that the tumor basically disappears as well. But over time, the tumor resurges, the edema grows, and by the last picture, you can see a, a large, dark, necrotic core of the tumor in the patient's brain. And so this is one way, you know, machine learning is impacting radiology today by segmenting these images. But I think that uncertainty estimation can improve this process. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few slides. So uh, there have been, you know, a few dramatic successes of using machine learning in medical uh, contexts, including ChexNet uh, for detecting pneumonia, the diabetic retinopathy algorithm, and uh, dermatology uh, skin cancer detection method. But none of these very popular, very successful, highly cited methods consider uncertainty estimation. These models are predicting point estimates of the probability of the condition of interest for, you know, whatever that condition may be. In my recent viewpoint, which is uh, co-authored by Jasper Snow from Google Brain, and Andrew Beam from Harvard uh, School of Public Health. We argue that equipping medical machine learning models with uncertainty estimation is you know, another tool in the toolbox that is critical for increasing the efficacy and adoption of these methods in the clinic. Additionally, by equipping these models with uncertainty estimation, there's a related uh, concept known as abstention where a model can decline to actually make a prediction under sufficient levels of uncertainty. And these uh, notions go hand in hand. So by incorporating these uncertainty estimations, models will also possibly be able to abstain, which is where uh, the model can ask for a second opinion, whether that be from a human physician who's in the loop or from another expert model who perhaps takes more time to uh, analyze or do inference on the patient data. So I've talked a, a lot about uncertainty, but I'd like to drill down in sort of um, some real life examples of uncertainty. So a common example growing up for all of us is predicting hurricane forecasts. So and weather forecasts in general, but we're all used to seeing this cone of uncertainty. As time progresses, there's a point estimate of where the hurricane will be at specific times which is indicated you know, generally by the, the center of the band. There are some dots in the center of the band. And then also you can think of them as, as confidence intervals or you know, regions of uncertainty over where the hurricane may go. And this is useful for you know, civil planning for individuals deciding how they're going to react to the storm. And uncertainty estimation improves our lives in weather forecasting. 
Well, in the machine learning world, we're kind of catching up. There's been a lot of recent interest in kind of understanding uncertainty estimation in machine learning models. And so in this 2017 paper from Kendall and Gall, uh, the task was to segment images from traffic. So by segmentation, I mean identifying what class a pixel belongs to, whether that be road, sidewalk, car, person, building, tree, sky, I think uh, signs or light poles might be another class taking a look at it now. And there's a ground truth that the models are trained on and their predictions are fairly accurate. You know, if you look at columns B and column C, there's a high concordance between the predicted classes and the actual classes, but there are some key discrepancies. And so what Kendall and Gall uh, did in this paper is they described how to decompose the predictive uncertainty of these models. And they decomposed it in um, now what is a very common way where they described the aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. So the aleatoric uncertainty is the irreducible uncertainty. This comes from random noise in the world. No matter how much data you collect, uh, you, you can't get rid of this uncertainty altogether. There's always gonna be a little bit of random noise. And this shows up in the fine-grained details of the model's predictions. For instance, where exactly does the sidewalk end? Or where is the person or the edges of the car? You can see that these are highlighted in column D. Epistemic uncertainty is kind of um, perhaps the more traditional uncertainty where we think of, or at least I think of, where the model is unsure of the class. So this is reducible uncertainty and it comes from uncertainty over the model parameters and also the choice of model, you know, random forest versus neural networks. And we can see that, for instance, the model is highly uncertainty, uncertain in the bottom row where the sidewalk is, perhaps because it looks quite a bit like road. And in the top row, underneath the car where there's shadow. So together, those make uh, predictive uncertainty. And so how could this be incorporated in a medical context? Well, going back to this quantitative disease uh, progression example, we would imagine that there would be high levels of aleatoric uncertainty around the edges of a segmentation. But perhaps more useful would be high levels of epistemic uncertainty, for instance, in these images, perhaps indicating that the model is unsure whether or not there's edema actually present or perhaps tumor present in a, if it were to segment that class. And that could indicate to clinicians that, you know, the tumor may be gone for now, but the model could be detecting something that indicates the tumor may um, make a resurgence. So in the paper, we talk about a predictive uncertainty in this example for heart disease. So for both of these patients, uh, the x-axis is the probability of heart disease from a logistic regression model, actually many of them, as I'll describe uh, in a minute. And the y-axis is a density. So we trained many of these logistic regression models. In fact, we trained 1,000. And we trained them on different splits of the training data and held out different portions of the training data to assess how the model prediction changes for these patients based on what data are included in the training data. So this is an example of bootstrapping. And we obtain a point estimate uh, for these patients, this patient's uh, risk of heart disease. Uh, it's about uh, you know, 0.55 uh, and 0.7 respectively for the two patients. And we can also view the predictive uncertainty over the different thousand iterations of the, the bootstrapped model uh, training. And so just to summarize, we trained a thousand different models, uh, trained a logistic regression model on each split of the data set. And this allowed us to obtain a distribution of point estimates. And so from this distribution of point estimates, we can estimate predictive uncertainty. And so one measure that you may consider there's a standard deviation of this distribution. And we can see that patient two has a much higher standard deviation than patient one. And I'll talk about how um, this could be more useful more extensively later, but one way maybe that, say for instance, this model is used in the clinic you know, relatively frequently and a, a clinician has grown to trust this model. When it has a high probability of predicting a condition and a low uncertainty, then that, that prediction can you know, you know, 
be trusted and not a cause for concern. But when, for instance, in patient two example, patients, uh, the second example, patient two, uh, there's a high level of uncertainty, which could prompt the physician or clinician or nurse to order a, you know, another test to provide the model more information or just take a second look at the data. Uh, perhaps the model could abstain from predicting when there's such a high level of uncertainty. So now I'm gonna switch tracks a little bit and talk about how to actually calculate uncertainty estimates. And so the key insight here is that calculating the uncertainty estimate relies on the underlying model. So for every type of model that you're gonna train, it's gonna be slightly different to calculate uncertainty. And most, but not all models contain a notion of distance from the training data. So this might be uh, subtracting your test point from the mean or subtracting the mean from your test point and you know, dividing that by the standard, the square of that by the standard deviation in some models. And we can use that to proxy on In a medical setting, this could be, you know, how far away a patient's presentation is from a typical presentation that a doctor's seen before in the past. If you've never seen anything like the patient that you're analyzing or trying to diagnose, then you're gonna be a little uncertain about the diagnosis most likely. So the first model I'm going to talk about is ensembles. So an ensemble consists of many versions of a model. So in the case of deep ensembles, this would just be M neural networks. Uh, in this case, in this figure, there are five different neural networks and each of these neural networks have been trained on the same data, but they've been trained with different random seeds. So this will cause differences in the training because the models will be presented uh, data in different orders, and they'll have uh, different back propagations because of that leading to potentially completely different weights because the lost landscape is, you know, so, so wild and there's not good, probably not going to be one global minima that weights converge to. And so how do we estimate uncertainty for these ensembles? Well, um, we give it a, the, we give every member of the ensemble the same test point. So this X sub I to every single model. And then we can consider the average of all the predictions from these models. And a uh, paper in 2017 introduced deep ensembles as a way to estimate uncertainty. So previously, ensembles were known to improve predictive performance by just considering the average over M models. But we can consider the distribution over many models to estimate predictive uncertainty. And uh, just for your reference, uh, some works, including like Obadiah et al. in 2019, found that as few as five models could be used to estimate predictive uncertainty relatively well. And so uh, this is great news because if you can train one model, presumably it's not you know so much computation, you could probably train five of them and, and get a cheap way to estimate predictive uncertainty without doing too much extra coding. The next method I'm gonna talk about is dropout. So this was initially introduced as a regularization technique for neural networks in which the connections between nodes of a neural network are randomly dropped with some probability P that is drawn from a Bernoulli distribution. And so during training, after in each forward pass, different weights of the network are set to zero. And in this way, the network can't you know, memorize the training data because different neurons are on or off um, every time. So to estimate uncertainty, there, there's a very simple trick. All you do is keep dropout on at test time. Typically that's turned off at test time. But if you keep it on at test time and for each test point, do many forward passes, then you're gonna see different connections in the neural network be on or off. And you can average, again, average all the predictions across many different forward passes and then consider the distribution of these predictions as well to estimate uh, uncertainty. And so this, again, if you have dropout in your network already, this is a, a very uh, cheap and easy way to uh, evaluate predictive uncertainty. And now switching tracks a little bit, we're going to talk about uh, Bayesian methods and specifically ideas around Bayesian neural networks, which are pretty popular. So in a Bayesian neural network, one puts a prior over the weights of a network. So the weights of a network are represented by theta and we just have some prior over those weights. So this is commonly a normal distribution over the weights. And then the natural question to ask is how can we apply Bayes rule here and estimate the posterior of these weights given training data. 
And as all good Bayesians know, it's, you know, you apply Bayes rule and we have the likelihood times the prior over the model evidence. But all those is, is simple to write out. Unfortunately, estimating this integral is entirely too complex. So when we see this d theta here, one is integrating over the entire parameter space. And with the exception of very small models, it's not possible to do this analytically. You know, for your neural network with millions or billions or trillions of parameters, you just can't integrate over the entire parameter space realistically. And so how does one calculate uh, predictive uncertainty uh, given this kind of uh, constraint? Well, there are a couple ways to estimate the posterior. And so Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulations are a gold standard if one can afford to run these simulations because they unfortunately scale poorly with dimension and data set size. A common and popular alternative nowadays is variational inference. And so in variational inference, one assumes that the posterior, given the training data, uh, is some distribution Q, which we choose to come from a family of distribution. So a common choice is a normal distribution. So we assume that the posterior distribution can be approximated by a normal distribution. And then our goal is to find the normal distribution that best approximates the posterior distribution. And so there are many ways to perform this approximation. Um, they all include different assumptions about the family of distributions one considers, how you can optimize them, you know, what the covariance matrix looks like. And you might be asking which is best, and it depends on what metric you consider. So some metrics people consider are log likelihood or root mean squared error. Uh, but a recent paper from 2019 compared all of these methods, ensemble lane dropout and HMC, and basically found on a variety of synthetic test examples, they were all deficient uh, over one or more examples. So there's definitely room for improvement here. Another way to estimate uncertainty is to have a model that naturally does it. You don't have to uh, um, append anything to the model, run the model many times, none of that. So in a Gaussian process, uh, what one does is you assume a prior, uh, not over the weights, but now over the whole function. So uh, it could be a little confusing, but basically uh, you're gonna assume that the training at every training point, there's a normal distribution uh, when you have a collection of random variables that all can be approximated by a normal distribution, you have a Gaussian process. And so the posterior, when you condition your prior given your training data, which is represented by the crosses, you know, here and here and here, uh, one obtains natural uncertainty estimates because you can ask uh, the posterior model, hey, what is the prediction at this point? And what a Gaussian process predicts for a point is not just a point, but a distribution. It'll give you a normal distribution given this input. It'll give you a mean and a variance. And so there's a natural way to directly estimate the predictive uncertainty. And as you can see, where there is no training data, there's a high level of predictive uncertainty. And you might be thinking, wow, Gaussian processes sound great. Why don't we use them all the time? Well, again, they scale poorly uh, in the number, they're cubic in the number of data. But there are people working on making good approximations um, to get around that issue. And so the last method I wanna talk about is conformal inference and related notions of coverage. So conformal inference is a statistical framework that has marginal coverage guarantees. And so I'm gonna break down what that means. And so conformal inference can be applied to any of your favorite machine learning models, just kind of off the shelf. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about conformal inference, because it's sort of uh, a topic that's not really covered in most machine learning curriculum or talked about nowadays, I find it really fascinating. I've actually written a, a Google Colab tutorial that you can access um, from these slides. And uh, it will walk you through how to perform conformal inference in uh, digit recognition. And the idea is that for your conformal method, you're predicting a set of predictions. So in classification, you're predicting, you know, multiple digits for a single image or no digits. You can perhaps predict the, the empty set. So given a test point, you apply the model trained on the previous N data, the training set, 
and it returns you an interval or a set in which the true value or true label for this test point will lie in the interval or set with at least one minus alpha probability. So if alpha is 0 0.05, then there's a 95% chance that the true value or true label lies in the predicted conformal set or interval. Now you're thinking, wow, this sounds awesome. Unfortunately, this is a marginal coverage guarantee. So what does that mean? These apply on average over the whole distribution. So what would be ideal is a conditional guarantee where given a specific example from the test set, then we could say um, that, you know, the, the true label lies in the predicted conformal set with 95% probability. Unfortunately, that is proven to be impossible for a distribution free, without assumptions about the distribution, excuse me. And uh, so in a medical context, this is a difference between basically a medication working for your, your specific patient with a 95% probability versus working for just an average patient from your patient population with a 95% probability. And so in a recent work that I pre-printed and is now under review, I asked the question of what are the coverage properties of approximate Bayesian methods? Bayesian methods are popular in the machine learning community for estimating uncertainty. And people have you know, done a lot of research into estimating how good approximations of the posterior are, but no one's really considered how often does the true value or label or, or value actually lie in a region of uncertainty from the model's prediction. And so I consider the coverage property. So coverage is defined as you know the frequency with which the true value lies in our predicted interval. So over uh, this set of data, model one uh, has the true value 80% of the time in its predictions. And model two has uh, that only 60% of the time. But model two has a much smaller width in terms of standard deviations of the training data set. And so in this work, we compared how, you know, the coverage properties of a variety of approximate Bayesian methods uh, perform. And we also compared the relative performance of coverage to more common uh, uncertainty measurements, including Briar score and expected calibration entropy. But Briar score and expected calibration entropy are, are very um, difficult to parse. Even uh, for me as a you know, computational graduate student, the definition of expected, uh, uh, you know, the ECE is um, very non-trivial to parse. It took me a couple of read-throughs. And so when we deploy methods in the clinic, we want the end user to be able to interpret, you know, how likely the model is to be correct and how much they can trust the model. And coverage is a natural and intuitive way to do this. So if you want to learn more, you can, uh, check out uh, my preprint. And then to tie this all together, we're gonna go back to the idea of abstention. So this allows a model to refrain from making a prediction. And there are two ways to formulate this notion. So if you decide beforehand that you're gonna require, or you're gonna permit your model to abstain, you could do what's called a cost-based objective. So this modifies, for instance, the binary loss where a model has a loss of zero if it predicts the correct class, one if it doesn't, and now it's going to have some intermediate al value alpha if the model abstains. So depending on how frequently you'd like the model to abstain, depending on how sure it is, you can set alpha to be you know, higher or lower. But there's an alternative formulation known uh, as a bounded objective. So now you have your traditional machine learning model F, uh, which can be any off-the-shelf model that you'd like to consider. And you can train another model, G, such that if G has sufficiently high levels of certainty, so it exceeds some threshold, you'll predict from your original model. And if it's less than some th certainty threshold, you'll abstain from making a prediction. And so these are two different ways to permit a model to abstain. And then after abstention, the model could ask a second opinion from an expert, whether that be another model. So like I said earlier, a model 
that has more expensive inference or maybe considers the entirety of a patient's EMR or, you know, other data uh, sources or ask the human, you know, the clinician or end user who is using the model. And so to conclude, I'd like to talk about uh, the main benefits of incorporating uncertainty estimation as I see them in medical machine learning. And the first set of benefits are related. So these are patient triage, resource allocation, and second opinions. So going back to the figure from the paper, patient one could, you know, be triaged based on the model's prediction here, assuming that the physician trusts this model, you know, the model's confident uh, that there's a high probability of heart disease, and then the normal procedures for, you know, treating heart disease can, can be followed in the hospital. But for patient two, with a higher level of uncertainty, that may prompt the end user to order more tests or to take a second look at the data. And so in this way, both high and low levels of uncertainty from machine learning models can impact resource allocation and patient triage. Another uh, obvious benefit in, in my view is outlier detection, like in the case of sinus and vernus. So if a test set uh, example is you know, far away from the train set, then the model should have high levels of predictive uncertainty and, and flag uh, another model or human to take a second look. Another benefit is data set shift, like the temporal shift that I described uh, before, or perhaps shifting the model from hospital to hospital, you know, even if they use the same EMR, hospitals will code in different ways. And uh, there is also the potential for thwarting adversarial examples. So this is a bit of a niche concern, but adversarial examples are when a small amount of uh, imperceptible noise is added to an image to cause the classification of that image to dramatically change. So in this example, a mole goes from being definitely benign according to a machine learning model to definitely cancerous. And you might be thinking, why, why does this matter in practice? Well, for insurance reimbursements, you, one can imagine that in the far future, insurance companies are advocating for machine learning models to be run on data and they'll only reimburse if you run that model and get the specific classification for the disease. And so there may be a perverse incentive to add adversarial noise to uh, these models or the, the data to obtain the class label that one desires. And uncertainty estimation is not gonna, you know, detect every adversarial attack. And it depends on the threat model and there are many caveats, but that's just one potential additional benefit. And then the final benefit I wanna emphasize, and I think is the most important thing uh, if you walk away from this talk uh, with anything is, I think uncertainty estimation can improve physician trust. And it'll do that by repeatedly calibrating the model's predictions to real life and in that way demonstrating value. So um, this graph uh, on the x-axis is some threshold and uh, for the probability of a, of a class. So uh, the further to the right, uh, the more uh, confident the model is in its prediction for a specific class. And I, I think uh, this specific example comes from CIFAR 10. And on the y-axis is accuracy. So you can see as the model becomes more confident, it becomes more accurate. And one can also imagine this extending to uncertainty estimates. So as the model is more confident in its predictions, lower levels of uncertainty and high probability, then a physician can you know, be very sure in their experience you know, with the model that the prediction will be correct. On the flip side, high levels of uncertainty could indicate that the the physician can't rely on, on, on this specific prediction and needs to either gather more data or uh, apply their clinical reasoning skills to determine what's going on. And to summarize, uh, uncertainty estimation is a key addition to medical machine learning models, among many other things. And I believe it will improve safety, robustness, and critically trust in these models. And then abstention is a complementary idea to allow models to ask for a second opinion and keep a human in the loop. And if you have any questions, I'd love to talk about them. And I'm also on Twitter, sometimes tweeting about these things uh, if you wanna discuss there as well. Thank you.